Revolutionary Girl Utena is a show with a bit of a reputation. On the surface, it's a fairly standard mid-90s low-budget anime. But after the first season, things start to get strange, bordering on the surreal, until the show concludes with one of the most peculiar endings I've ever seen. It can be difficult, on a first watch, to figure out what the show is trying to say. Luckily, that's why I'm here. Hello everyone, I'm Sam, and today I'll be exploring Revolutionary Girl Utena. I'll be offering up some of my interpretations and observations. Fair warning, this video will contain spoilers for the entirety of Revolutionary Girl Lutena. Also, these are only my interpretations of the show. This is definitely a series I recommend you watch for yourself. Utena is, at heart, a coming-of-age story. But it isn't very forthcoming with a lot of its messages. So before we talk about Utena, if you don't mind, let's take a step back to English class and talk about allegory. Dictionary.com defines allegory as a representation of an abstract or spiritual meaning through concrete or material form, figurative treatment of one subject under the guise of another. It can also simply mean a symbolic narrative. I like to think of allegories as stories with separate, internally consistent layers of interpretation. Whereas most stories operate on the literal layer alone, an allegorical narrative has one literal layer and one or more symbolic layers. These symbolic layers are built by authors when they use elements of their work as symbols that convey a secondary meaning. Moving on to Utena. Why do I suggest that Utena is an allegory? The answer is pretty simple. The show uses bizarre imagery that adds almost nothing to our literal understanding, but is nevertheless consistent. These symbols might not be obvious at first. The swords, rings, flowers, etc and I wouldn't fault you for failing to pick up on the whole symbolic meaning of these items on a first viewing. But during the second and third seasons, this imagery becomes much weirder, like the butterfly in Mikage's elevator, or Akio's car in Planetarium, and it doesn't really mesh with what's happening on screen at all. This is a strong indicator that these images have symbolic meaning, and that the show is asking us to identify what that meaning is. Swords and rings are literally swords and rings, but they represent other things too. By hitting us over the head with the weird stuff at the end, we're encouraged to go back and contemplate the significance of the more routine stuff. Utena's lack of a budget helps us immensely here. When creating with less resources, every part of a story needs to do more to justify its inclusion. Given the need to be deliberate due to resource limitation, it's safe to assume that most of Utena is put together intentionally, and that the show has several layers of allegorical meaning. Each scene is meaningful as well as functional. This doesn't mean that every scene is meant to be some kind of statement on its own, merely that the creative team chose to include the scenes that are present in the final version for a reason. Creative intent is not the end-all be-all of criticism, but when it's on display, criticism does become much easier. A disclaimer before we move on. I'm focusing on how adolescence is portrayed in Utena, which is a work of fiction. The actual clinical psychology of adolescence is something I cannot meaningfully speak to. That said, in fiction, adolescence is commonly depicted in one of two modes. Either it is constructive, or it is destructive. Constructive portrayals of adolescence depict it as a process of layering new experiences and emotions on top of the foundations that make up identity. The boundary between childhood and adulthood is demarcated by how much knowledge someone possesses. To put it another way, an adult is someone who knows how to be an adult. This is the period in our lives when we first start building our identities using the raw material we have been given. Many constructive portrayals of adolescence stress the significance and value of education and educational institutions. After all, knowledge is the thing separating children and adults, and schools are where children acquire both practical knowledge and interpersonal skills. Destructive portrayals of adolescence, like Utena, on the other hand, frame it as an act of, well, destruction and replacement. Your identity as an adult cannot coexist with your identity as a child because your childhood identity is built upon too many false notions and misunderstandings for it to remain functional in the real world. Entering the adult world with a childlike mindset is at best naive and at worst totally self-destructive. To paraphrase Herman Hesse's 1919 novel Demian, 
a work that Utena is heavily inspired by, the world is divided into two parts, the world of children and the world of adults. The world of children is lighthearted and peaceful, whereas the world of adults is painful and dangerous. Adolescence starts with the painful realization that we must leave the first to join the second. It is the period of our lives when we must cast off the delusions and beliefs that are incompatible with the incontrovertible truths of the grown-up world. This understanding suggests that adolescence is a deeply personal and individualized process. However, we have little choice as to when our adolescence begins. Once a child realizes that they can't stay a child forever, or they begin to participate in adult society, or they get dragged into the adult world through trauma, they are forced to essentially adapt psychologically or die. This dialogue is almost a direct quote from Demian. The original, keep in mind that this is translated from German, goes kind of like this. The bird fights its way out of the egg. The egg is the world. Who would be born must first destroy a world. The bird flies to God. That God's name is Abraxas. We'll come back to this in a bit, but I wasn't surprised to see that Utena explicitly references Demian. The works are very similar overall. Both deal with questions of reality versus fantasy, self-actualization, the destructive power of institutions, and the value of introspection in navigating the stormy waters of adolescence. Fun piece of trivia, even though the Abraxas mentioned in Hesse's writing does not exist in the story of Utena, it is referenced in the title of a song on the soundtrack. If you don't like the terms constructive or destructive, you could also visualize this distinction as evolutionary versus revolutionary depictions of adolescence. The gradual accumulation of small changes or sudden drastic change, Consider the title, Revolutionary Girl Utena. What does being a revolutionary girl actually mean? Intuitively, it means being a girl who causes or supports a revolution. But that's just kicking the can one step further. What type of revolution or revolutions does Utena cause? Revolution has a few common definitions. Sudden political change, sometimes by force, at the expense of an established authority. Pervasive social change often coupled with the creation of new social norms, think the sexual revolution of the 60s. Or, if we're willing to broaden our horizons a bit and look at mechanical definitions, a revolution can refer to one rotation or completion of a cycle and the return to an original point. I would suggest that Utena actually causes all of these different types of revolution to occur. So, in some sense, she's paradigmatic of what it means to be a revolutionary girl. She functionally ousted not only the student council, but also the Mikage seminar, and even directly contested Akio himself. She did not destroy the institution, but through her sacrifice, she liberated many of the other characters, Anthe, the student council, and the Black Rose Duelist, from being controlled and exploited by Akio. This is a fundamental change in the power dynamics of the school, at least insofar as they relate to the characters we see in the show. In terms of social revolution, we can't really talk about Utena without discussing how Utena herself challenges traditional gender roles and sexual norms. Instead of being the helpless princess eternally being rescued, she was so inspired by the nobility of her prince that she wanted to emulate his heroism. She possesses strong features, is athletic, wears boys' clothes, exhibits some degree of dominance over Anthe and Wakaba, and respects what I can only refer to as traditional chivalry. I'm going to avoid making any explicit statements about Utena's sexual orientation because, honestly, I don't think it's 100% clear. There is a case to be made for Utena being homosexual, of course, but she may also be bisexual or heterosexual, and all of these cases can be well supported depending on how you read the text. What cannot be questioned, though, is that Utena finds value in several aspects of traditional masculinity as well as traditional femininity. What's more, I feel classifying Utena into some sort of sexual orientation or gender category is doing the show a disservice when the real message to take away is that the character is powerful because she is self-determined, 
not because of some intrinsic quality she possesses. Her appearance, actions, and demeanor are not defined by her sex or her gender, but rather are expressions of her unique personality. This flies in the face of what Japanese society still largely expects out of adult women. Utena also perpetuates cycles. The show is bookended with the beginning and end of a single cycle. It opens with Utena being given a ring, and ends with Akio preparing to issue more rings and create more duelists. The three sections themselves are cyclical, they have seven official duels each, and proceed through each opponent in turn. Once the series of opponents is finished, the sequence starts over from the beginning. The actual sequence itself proceeds generally from green, Sayonji, to blue, Miki, orange, Juri, yellow, Nanami, and finally, red, Toga, each season. But never exactly, so I don't want to hang too much on that. If no one makes it to the end, the procession repeats itself from the beginning. Duels all have names, as we learn from Akio in the recap at the end of the Student Council arc, with the name of the final duel being Revolution. This too has a double meaning. Either the ritual is completed and Akio can revolutionize the world, or the ritual fails and the process must be repeated. The revolution of the cycle completes. Let's look again at the saying that the student council repeats all the time, the one from Demian. Understanding how Utena relates to adolescence requires unpacking the various meanings from this little mantra. If anything, it is a more direct and clear statement of the ideas than the original quote from Demian. It deals with identity and the self, and insists that the we the characters wish to become is incompatible with the world as it is now, necessitating that the world be destroyed in a manner of speaking. This is consistent with depictions of adolescence as a fundamentally destructive process. This aphorism is repeated frequently. Whenever the student council meets to discuss the duels, they always preface their meeting with it. Why? I would like to suggest that it is being repeated ritualistically. Being a duelist comes with certain norms, and repeating the saying before talking about the duels may be one of them. It primes the duelist to consider what they're fighting for, and in metaphorical terms, frames their struggle to obtain the power to revolutionize the world as a struggle of life and death. We know, however, that End of the World, Akio, has no intention of surrendering that power to the duelists. Further, the duels themselves, and therefore all of the ritual and magic and fantasy attached to them, are actually a fabrication, a collection of illusions created by Akio. Really, the duels are designed to prepare an individual for sacrifice, and are more of a checklist or test rather than a legitimate contest. So, we see that what End of the World wants is a collection of individuals capable of dueling who will follow his established plan. To make that so, he needs the members of the student council to be reliant upon him, to think that they are unable to smash the world shell without help from End of the World. He has associated the act of changing the world with the rituals of dueling. This may be why the duelists all have some sort of intractable psychological problem, but that last bit is just speculation. The connection between ritual and authority is reinforced if we look at the transformation sequence that plays before each duel. The music, the flair, and the ceremony makes the duel seem important. Again, it is a ritual that serves to obfuscate Akio's involvement. Further, we can consider the forest where the duels take place. The forest is forbidden except for the duels. End of the World doesn't want the duelists to see behind the curtain and risk breaking the illusion, lest they realize that the duels aren't magical and that they're really just going through the motions that he has planned for them. In actuality, the members of the student council could have smashed their individual shells at any time. It just took the wake-up call of losing to Utena for each member to realize it. They learn that the power to smash the world's shell, the power to make oneself compatible with the adult world, 
is really a power of introspection and reflection, not a power that is granted to them by some external authority or some sort of special magical force. To put it another way, if the Demian poem is about dispelling false beliefs and taking control of one's life, then the belief they all hold, that end of the world will provide them with the power to revolutionize the world, is itself a false belief that needs to be dispelled, and end of the world has taken control of their lives without telling them. Instead of putting them in control, and into the adult world, they have merely been moved from the world of childhood where they had no control anyway, to some sort of in-between world where they only have the illusion of control. Following the final duels, they abandon the rituals completely, and converse with each other frankly and directly. They behave in a manner befitting adults, and they are all willing to change themselves so they can continue to grow. This indicates to me that Utena is a series interested in questioning the relationship between individuals and authority, especially during adolescence. Given the painful and confusing nature of adolescence, individuals are highly prone to manipulation and coercion. Teenagers make bad decisions, and we need to hold authority figures to a higher standard if they attempt to take advantage of teenagers during this time. Further, authority has no business shepherding teens through this process either. A one-size-fits-all collection of rituals will not successfully guide anyone struggling with their newfound identity into the world of adulthood. The two main triggers for the beginning of adolescence, sexual awakening and the recognition of one's own mortality, are not exactly issues that institutions and authority figures are well equipped to handle, and how we choose to cope with those issues is unique to each of us. What we see at Otori Academy, then, is an institution that is not trying to help its students at all. It preys upon their dysfunction so that they may perform some role for the already established authority. I don't want to make the jump and say that Utena is condemning school in general, but I do think that Utena is suggesting that the pressure to complete a higher education, and the fact that completing your education is tied directly to self-worth in modern society, thanks to a collection of rituals, does to some extent hinder the ability of students to do the introspection needed to cope with the significant psychological issues that occur during adolescence. But these are just my thoughts. If you've stuck with me this long, I want to give you my sincere thanks for watching. Utena is one of my favorite shows ever, and I've been eager to get my thoughts down on paper, well, down on video, for a while now. If you agree with me, disagree with me, or just want to talk about how your day is going, feel free to leave a comment. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like since it helps me know what kind of content I should make. I have other videos, even though I update slowly, so I hope you decide to subscribe. If you want to learn more about Utena, you may want to check out the series Geek Nights Presents Utena, also on YouTube. They go into a more exhaustive episode-by-episode -episode breakdown and provide some excellent insight into how the specific details play into Utena's broader themes. There's a link in the description below. Again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.